Hi, folks. Thanks for joining us. While participants trickle in, um, we're going to use this time to launch a poll just to find out if you have visited a community fridge. And in the chat, please let us know um, what interested you in participating in today's presentation. So, so far, 60% of respondents have not. Kara is interested in learning about mutual aid. Christine wants to end food scarcity in Canada. Right. Just saying, yeah, definitely. A volunteer with the community fridges in Hamilton, so wanted to see the presentation, great. We have a member of the McQuesting community planning team and we're interested in having a community fridge in our neighborhood. Awesome. Patricia, would you mind um, sending me a message directly with your contact information and maybe I can pass that on to, to Jacqueline today? just to get you folks connected. B says, I have been visiting John Street Fridge. I am aware of my privilege and want to share with my community. Wonderful. Thank you for doing so. So a few folks are just trickling in. We'll get started in about a minute or so. So it's nice to know that some folks are just wanting to support the community um, and wanting to find out more information about this great grassroots initiative. Wonderful. So we are gonna go ahead and get started. Thank you for joining our webinars today. If you've been with us, for the rest of the presentations. You know, my name is Shayla Gutierrez. I'm the Garden Program Coordinator at Green Venture. Today, I'm joined by Shi Yoon. She is our youth volunteer who will be in the chat room monitoring for any questions. We are recording today's session and it will be available to you at a later date. Throughout the session, we encourage you to use the chat box for any questions to be answered at the end of the presentation. And if for some reason, we get disconnected, you will be placed in the waiting room and we will let you right back in as soon as we can. Mics are turned off just to ensure quality of the sound for our recording and that we have good sound for today's session. Today, we are joined by Jacqueline Cantor, current founder and organizer of Community Fridges Hammond, a network of outdoor fridges that provide free food to people in the community. Fridges are filled by donations from other community people and businesses. Last year, Green Venture volunteers for Girl Row were able to help by directly contributing donations to the fridges, producing food miles and ensuring access to fresh produce. I'm gonna go ahead and stop my screen share and let Jacqueline share more about this grassroots initiative. Awesome, thank you so much, Shayla. Um, I'm going to start off, of course, with a uh, land acknowledgement, which is very important to our organization, which operates out of so called Hamilton. Uh, Community Fridges Hamont operates out of the traditional territories of the Erie, Neutral, Huron, Wendat, Haudenosaunee, and Mississaugas. This land is covered with, by the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant, which was an agreement between the Haudenosaunee and Anishinaabek in 1701 to share and care for the resources of this land. So 
this is tied directly into what we're doing and what we should all be mindful of um, in our community work. Uh, the dish of this agreement represents the Great Lakes. So the spoon in this agreement represents that we are all to share the resources of the Great Lakes. Uh, we share the responsibility of ensuring the dish is never empty, which includes taking care of the land and the creatures we share it with. According to, to this philosophy, all parties are a treaty. Uh, to this treaty, share the land while maintaining their sovereignty. In other words, the diverse nature of Indigenous nations and cultures is to be recognized. And the three basic rules of this treaty are of, of this agreement are only take what you need. Second, you always leave something in the dish for everyone else. And third, you always keep the dish clean. So that ties directly into what we do in our mutual aid organization. Um, it's really important that we are mindful of our privileges and what we are able to share uh, with our resources. So I'm gonna be talking about food security, mutual aid and the community fridges today. And I wanted to start with kind of an intro about me so that you know a little bit about who is talking at you today. Uh, my name is Jacqueline Cantor. My pronouns are they, them. I am a white settler. I'm queer, disabled, and I'm a multi-gen Hamiltonian. Um, and I am an organizer of Community Fridges Hamont, which launched, um, we launched our first location uh, in March, 2021. So we're coming up on a year. Um, and then I've got a little blurb about myself uh, in 2015, I quit a stable office job to pursue kind of a lifestyle shift. I was a high school dropout before that, so I wanted to pursue an education as well. So I went to Mohawk College. Um, they have a awesome community garden on site at Mohawk College. So during my summer semester there, I spent a lot of time at the community garden. And um, that's where I got really immersed in food growth and got to learn a lot of hands-on experience about growing food. Uh, and I was so passionate about that, that I also got a job with the sustainability department there and became the community garden coordinator, which led me to teaching other people about growing food while I was educating myself. So um, that's kind of my background about food growth. Um, that's kind of where my real deep passion lies is in community gardens and in growing food, uh, which is just a hobby right now. I uh, love to garden at Hill Street Garden. I have a plot there um, and I'm a nanny. So there's our dear Beasley fridge. So food security is something I'm sure we are all aware is an issue in Hamilton and elsewhere. Um, food security can actually be categorized into three uh, categories. So there are different levels to it. There is marginal food insecurity, moderate food insecurity, and severe food insecurity, which means um, the most severe would be missing meals and having to potentially go days without eating. Um, most food insecure people are in the workforce and it is more of a matter of low income or precarious work so it's not just people who are entirely without work that are food insecure um, it, it's happening to a lot of people at different levels food insecurity can cause a lot of health issues of course mental health and physical health it can cause uh, worsening of chronic conditions um, it can cause folks to struggle to adhere to therapeutic diets because they're not able to access uh, nutritious food due to cost or convenience. Um, I know where I live, there's not a whole lot of grocery stores around, so it can be challenging to access nutritious food. Um, and it can also lead to developmental risks, behavioral problems, difficulty in school among children. So food insecurity, of course, uh, was exacerbated by the pandemic. CERB provided temporary relief for some folks, but utilization of food banks and meal programs has increased since that uh, support has not been a long-term financial support from the government. Um, so listed here are rate increases that were seen from Wesley Urban Ministries, Welcome in, uh, Community Center, Food for Kids, Neighbor to Neighbor, Nawasa Kandas, Winteg, 
uh, the Flamborough Food Bank Jewish Family Services. Most of these organi organizations have seen 20% to over 50% uh, rate increase of utilization during the pandemic. Yet research has shown that most, most food insecure households don't actually use food banks um, for a variety of reasons. Further, there's no evidence that food charity is able to move households out of food insecurity. It's very common for people who've received help from food banks to report still needing more food. Many food bank directors are also quick to acknowledge that people they serve need more food than they can provide. So Food Banks Canada has policy change recommendations because they also acknowledge that more support is needed from the government. So there are five recommendations here are new supports for renters, uh, living with low wages, modernize and expand um, those supports, a uh, path forward where no one, there's a, a, sorry, I can only see part of my screen here. There we go. A progress towards a, a minimum income floor. So again, financial supports are, are needed to avoid food insecurity and in, increase supports for low income single adults and enhance measures to reduce Northern food insecurity. So um, again, in regards to single adults, that's another issue when it comes to food insecurity. Folks that live alone also um, experience higher rates of food insecurity because they don't have that second income to fall back on when it comes to um, the bills that they have to pay. So food sovereignty is kind of on the other hand of food insecurity. Whether you're familiar or not with food insecurity, it's something I've been trying to learn more about recently. Um, so here's a quote from Joanne Taylor. It says, here in Canada, food, in food security is a big problem and it's usually experienced by people that are marginalized and oppressed. That includes First Nations, northerly communities, single mothers and children. For the two, 2 billion people in the world who are food insecure, food sovereignty is another topic also being explored. Um, so this talks about taking back freedom to grow your own food, to market your own food, and to have decision-making power over those food systems, and to acknowledge food as a human right. So um, there are different communities who are acknowledging that food is a human right, and there's um, really discrepancies from the government, especially when it comes to communities of color. Um, Black and Indigenous communities in Toronto are having trouble accessing certain programming um, or setting up programming for themselves. So here's an example of a great program that's been set up in Toronto called Sundance Harvest. Um, it's It was created by Cheyenne Sundance in North York. It's a program that uh, teaches workshops and makes food growth accessible to Black and um, people of color in Toronto. And Food Share Toronto does a lot of awesome work uh, in Toronto, and they actually have a petition going on right now um, in regards to uh, acknowledging the right to food and making supports towards these kinds of programs um, more accessible um, and fighting against the red tape and delays and other challenges that folks uh, come across when they are trying to access um, food programming. And then mutual aid. Uh, there's a picture here um, from the Black Panthers and their breakfast program, which is one of the most famous examples of mutual aid that you might be aware of. So this graphic here is kind of just a cool poster I found online. That's like a long scrolling list of the history of mutual aid um, done in a visual kind of storytelling way. So the Black Panthers breakfast program, um, like I said, was one of the most well-known and successful examples of mutual aid um, that actually was so successful. Of course, the FBI took it as a threat and shut it down, um, but it resulted in um, national breakfast programs because they realized that, that um, folks were doing it on the ground. So it really should have been, if people on the ground could do such a better job than the government was doing, it, it um, kicked the government into action. Um, so the Black Panthers also did so many other programs like uh, 
free ambulance and rides for elderly people running errands, etc. So they were really involved in supporting their community. And then there's also mentioned here is the Young Lords Garbage Offensive, which was a crew that uh, cleaned up garbage in New York when their streets were not being tended to appropriately. So here is some words from In Our Hearts New York City, who's a mutual aid group in New York that uh, we've taken a lot of inspiration from the community fridges for. They oversee, I believe it's like over a hundred community fridges in New York. So they are kind of um, a great example for a lot of the community fridge organizations to look to. So it, it says here that mutual aid groups are made up of organizers and volunteers who address the needs of the community. Many mutual aid groups cropped up uh, during the pandemic and started in Google Docs and Slack channels, which is how we operate. Um, in short, people offer help, which could be like resources, food or money or skills, driving or picking up prescriptions, and then they're redistributed to folks in need. Mutual aid systems operate under the notion that everyone has something to contribute and everyone has something they need. And as well, mutual aid is not charity. Um, it's the community caring for the community. It's not funded like a charity would be. So um, a common saying or slogan in mutual aid is solidarity, not charity. Fund fundamentally, mutual aid is about building bottom up or horizontal structures rather than being um, organized or having a hierarchy system from the top down. Um, mutual aid goes beyond simple charity or patronage and mobilizes society itself for society itself. In, the, in its most advanced form, it can show us a powerful vision of an alternate, alternative society, one in which we're no longer imagined as individual brands, consumers, or entrepreneurs in endless competition, but a collective connected by compassion, cooperation, and the spirit of participatory democracy. So I think that's a lovely and realistic goal to have if we all work together. And then finally, I'm going to talk about the community fridges. So take what you need, leave what you can is another slogan that we use for the community fridges and that ties again directly back into the dish with one spoon. Um, so it's all about sharing our resources and respecting the spaces that we all share together. So community fridges Hamont oversees three community fridges in Hamilton and all of the fridges are accessible 24 seven outdoors and they're enclosed in weatherized shelters. Um, similar initiatives have been popping up in most large cities across North America. There's, um, I forget the exact number, there's like eight in Toronto. There is one in Kitchener, Calgary, Vancouver, Regina, and there's numerous all across the US. Through mutual aid, these programs build stronger and more connected communities. So these are our three locations. Uh, we've got our first that's coming up on a year old is uh, on the West Mountain outside of today's family early learning and childcare. That's our Gilkson location. And then we've got downtown at John and Barton. We've got our Beasley location that's outside a warehouse space owned by Merritt Brewing. And the third is our most recent was opened in August. Um, that's outside of Ottawa Market on Ottawa Street. And then since then, we've also um, been really happy to see other groups organizing and, and starting other locations. So there's also been the Lock Street fridge that's opened in the Kirkendall neighborhood of Hamilton. And there's also been a pantry called Strathcona Pantry that's opened up. So we're happy to keep kind of spreading the word and seeing other uh, communities, maybe other hyper local communities organizing community fridges as well. So community fridge volunteers, we are all volunteers. So it is a big group, a hundred active volunteers per week. Um, we have different roles that folks can take on and uh, oversee kind of coordination tasks. And then we've also got more casual volunteers. So there's no necessary commitment to take on. You can be a casual volunteer if you'd like to, but if you would like to get more involved in the actual 
organization and coordination, there is a lot of stuff to plan and organize on an ongoing basis. So that help is always appreciated. Um, and I think it's pretty fulfilling to be involved on a deeper level with. So we've got um, we've got it pretty planned out at this point. So we've got program coordination. We've got fridge checkers, which are people every single day going out to all of the locations to clean, throw out anything that shouldn't be there, make sure temperatures are safe and loop in the rest of the group to what's happening at the fridges. We've got builders. All of our uh, shelters have been built by volunteers. Um, we've got volunteer coordination, schedule coordination, donation pickups, um, schedule media posters and artists who've painted the beautiful shelters and design teams who help with our social media stuff. So it's a big crew, all volunteers. So there are lots of benefits to community fridges. They are great to work in connection with other supports in the community. They can't do everything, but there are lots of benefits to their um, low restriction kind of methods. So there's no re registration or stipulations. Folks are welcome to take whatever they need. There's no limit on what, what they can access. We trust community members to determine that for themselves. Um, there's a request board where people can let us know what is most needed for them because everyone deserves to have preferences and let us know what they need. Um, and a lot of community members um, appreciate that they they can both give to the program and receive from the program so it is kind of a breathing and reciprocal organization to take part in and we can also reduce food waste by accepting end of day goods um produce that isn't quite at its peak for selling so donating to the community fridges Donations can be made by anyone at any time. Um, volunteers and our volunteer team do organize some of the donations, but we rely on the greater community to donate whenever they're able. If you're out grocery shopping and you can pick up a couple extra things and swing by a fridge, that's awesome. Um, if you can organize a non-perishable food drive, if you've got a storefront or a church or a community group, you can organize a food drive. That's also really great. Um, we don't personally do any fundraising through our group, but sometimes folks will let, let their friends or family know on their Instagram or their Facebook that they're going out to shop. If anyone wants to send them an e-transfer or something like that, that can help to afford you more frequent or larger shops. So we also do some prepared food donation pickups, which are really awesome. We've been doing these twice weekly pickups of prepared food, which is about 300 meals a week we've been getting from uh, this organization called Hunger Free Halton, which is awesome. And we also really appreciate meals donated from restaurants. We don't accept homemade food, but if we can ever connect with more restaurants or certified kitchens to get more of those prepared meals, that's awesome. And then rescued food so that we can cut down on food waste. Um, this is also a big, uh, a big factor in how much produce we get into the fridges. We've also got these twice weekly again from Desi Mandy in Burlington, um, as well as donations from Dilly's Pharmacy in the Hamilton Farmer's Market. And then some other local farms um, just donate when they've got a lot of surplus that they're not gonna be able to sell. Those are really great um, to cut down on food that might otherwise be wasted. We've got a place that it will get home very quickly. so. If anything is a little bit blemished and maybe not great to have on your store shelves, but still has a lot of life left in it, then we're happy to take it. There's a oh, there's a food food waste chart. Um, I think we all know that food waste is bad, but 60% of food produced in Canada is lost or wasted each year. So I know we all have to do our part. Um, to cut down on that a little bit. So if you have any connections to any grocery stores or restaurants or any bakeries, or there's sometimes end of day bread is also a really great um, thing that can be tossed into the freezer. Or... And then garden grown donations. Um, so that was a great help. Like Shayla had mentioned last summer, we had 
people um, coming by and donating their 100 zucchinis that they had excess of or um, herbs and everything that that was a great benefit in the summertime so whether it's just a excess that you've got or whether you want to actually plan to grow extra for our fridges we've got three now so there's lots lots of place to put those extra so i've also included this here green venture grew almost 500 pounds um, that they were able to donate to neighbor to neighbor and the community fridges last summer through their grow row program so they're actually when they're sent through that program they're actually weighing them out so that's a huge help to community members that not might not have that access to fresh affordable um, fruits and vegetables so if you have the garden space um, to grow a little bit extra for the community fridges that's that's a really great help if you can just remove some dirt before putting them in the fridge um, yeah, so how you can support the fridges again, you can simply sharing online is a great help getting the word out about the fridges. Um, people are still always hearing about them for the first time. We've been operating for a year now, but it's um, there's always more people to reach, whether that's people that need the resource or people that can support it. Um, sharing on Facebook or Twitter or Instagram, we're on all of those. Um, we always need people to clean the fridge. They are cleaned three times a day for most locations. Um, so volunteering with us to clean the fridge or volunteering for donation pickups or donating to the fridge or reaching out to neighbors, businesses. Um, we've got brochures. If that helps you do any outreach. And that's our contact information. So that's about it for me. Thank you. Thank you so yeah. much. Earlier today, we had Food for Life join us and um, you you spoke about, you know, if people have bad produce or, or, you know, something that has blemishes and stuff and Food for Life said, best before doesn't mean bad after. So really taking the time to understand what those expiration dates mean um, and where we can, we, we can provide those and put those in place. So thanks so much, Jacqueline. Yeah, um, I'm going to open the floor now to any questions. Um, if you have, if you'd like, we can make it a discussion. And if you'd like to unmute your mic and ask Jacqueline questions yourself, we can certainly do that. So I'm going to um, allow participants to unmute themselves now. So you should have that access. So if you have any questions, please feel free to unmute yourself and ask. Although I must say Jacqueline did a very great job of explaining exactly what, um, you know, how to support the community fridges. Oh, thank you. And as a reminder, I will send a follow-up email with uh, links and any resources that Jacqueline has provided in a follow-up email within a few days so that you have that. As well as the link to this recorded webinar, if you'd like to run through the presentation again. said, how did you find your beautiful muralist? Oh yeah, um, so the the Gilkson fridge actually was painted um, by a bunch of after school kids, uh, after school program. And then the, the Beasley fridge, the one that says, take what you need, leave what you can was painted by Heidi Burton who volunteered for the role of both of the painters graciously took it on as a volunteer opportunity to kind of donate that towards the community. Um, and then the uh, Crown Point fridge was painted by Kayla Whitney, co.design is her handle. So we've had a few people uh, reach out and offer their artistic skills, which we're very thankful for. They're all beautiful, so. Aisha asks, do you think we will see community kitchens at any point or do these exist already so that people can cook this food as well? I'm not sure. I, yeah, I don't, I don't know. Um, yeah, I don't know if there would be anything like that would just be open to 
having anyone come in. There's there's definitely been things in the past like Food Not Bombs, which is sort of like a community kitchen and then community um, meals. But I, I don't, it would be awesome if there was something that would be available to let folks utilize a kitchen. I'm not sure. I think um, we have someone from McQuestion Urban Farm and I know that McQuestion Urban Farm does some programming around um, learning how to cook too. Yeah. Yeah, so um, so Craig asked, what feedback has there been from the community about the impact the fridges are having? And do you have any tracking of the fridge use? Feedback has been um, thankful, positive, and mixed at times. Um, there's some people that don't always want them in their community, unfortunately, but generally the people that are utilizing the fridges are um, thankful for them being there because they don't have other options a lot of the time, unfortunately, or they're at least allowing them to direct their money elsewhere. Um, so they're able to save a little bit on groceries because they their money is stretched really thin. So they are appreciative of that and they are taking a moment to thank volunteers while they're there. But we don't always have a lot of communication with people that are utilizing the community fridges. And yeah, no, we don't we don't track anything. It's all anonymous. Um, it's all uh, really barrier free. So we don't have any way to track the utilization. Um, it's kind of something we might look towards in the future of at least getting more feedback. We're not going to um, track to get information really, but it, it would be good to know exactly what people need. But we do have those request boards there. So a lot of the feedback, unfortunately, is people need more food a lot of the time, but it goes quick. Yeah, um, so I'm curious to know, um, was was it difficult to set up the community fridges? Was there a lot of red tape in doing so? Um, it's, it helps that it, all of our locations have been with uh, businesses. So that aspect has made it possible. We tried with other locations that were either city owned or city funded, and that didn't end up being possible because there was red tape in those instances. Um, if the city has too much say, then it became not possible. But with them being privately owned businesses, that aspect wasn't too challenging. Great. There's then, a lot of work that goes into it, which is challenging, but. Yeah, but it seems like you have a pretty great group of volunteers who absolutely. are active. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then can you just go back really quickly to the contact information? Mm-hmm. And in the chat too, I see that they're, they have, um, Haley has plugged in um, the community fridges. Thank you. Contact email too. Awesome. Yeah. And again, I will, I will provide a follow-up email um, with further resources. Um, B says, every time I go, people seem to just materialize and making me realize how necessary this respectful offering is. Yeah. Yeah. There is a lot of support for the community fridges, but the need still surpasses the amount of food that's going into them. So we expect um, we expect that we will likely expand, but we also still know that it's not the solution. So um, even if we get more locations, more food flowing into them will still be needed. But um, again, that's not gonna be the solution. People need money and housing. And... Yeah. So um, it doesn't look like there's any more questions in the chat. Again, I, I will provide the contact information. Oh, Christine has raised her hand. Go ahead, Christine. Oh, hi there. I just wanted to say, first of all, thank you so, so much. That was really it, like from the beginning you started speaking, I already, even just from, from the first I've learned in more detail from the, even the land acknowledgement was in more detail than I've received in any of the other presentations. So thank you. Um, and I was just thinking, I remember because I was doing research about community 
gardens. And I remember seeing that the government of Canada was funding community gardens at the beginning of the pandemic. And there was a, a bunch of requests uh, for proposals. And, and I'm wondering now if Hamilton got any of that funding and how much of it and where, and maybe how those connections or if any of that funding could be, um, hey, you know, hey, community gardens, how much of those vegetables, you know, and that grow, I was very, very honored to be part of the Grow a Row program. Um, I, I did see my tomato up on that screen. <laughs> and um, the more people know and can be given the opportunity to help, I do believe um, they will. So I don't know if that's something that has come to mind, but I wanted to flag it as a potential opportunity. Thank you very much. Um, I think land acknowledgements are really educational if you can take some time to look into it, which I wanted to not do a performative land acknowledgement when I started to having to give them when we were doing our orientations. I know this isn't your question, but our orientations and workshops and stuff through our group, I was afraid that they would be performative, but um, I took some time to actually like watch videos on land acknowledgements and, and read about them and stuff and realize like, it's really interesting. And like, we need to be learning this history for ourselves. And so that we can relay that information um, more authentically. So I appreciate that that was conveyed. On the other hand, I don't, that sounds like maybe something Shayla would know more about than me, but I don't, I don't know anything about the funding for community gardens. I would love if community gardens were all over the place, but, um, but yeah, we absolutely want to get more people aware that they can donate um, their, their produce to the community fridges and I'm not sure where else we can go with that. Yeah, um, I I don't have an answer for that. I know that currently through a neighbor to neighbors uh, community garden network, there is I think maybe about 70 community gardens or so that are listed on there, but um, each garden does run independently. So um, it's really, um, you know, most, well, mostly they're run by volunteer base and just those groups that are, are they see a space that is good for community gardens so yeah uh, we'll have to look into that and see um, how more um, what more can be done there um, with that said uh, I do want to encourage you to go to greenventure.ca eco house garden programs and and let us know your suggestions on how to continue to grow and empower gardeners so that we can continue to um, provide supports for um, the community fridges. So thank you all for joining us today with for all our speakers for joining us today and all of you for tuning in and our supporters and our volunteers. Together, believe it or not, we are empowering gardeners and creating a greener future for everyone. So please be sure to check back on Green Ventures social media for uh, more information about day two's registration and um, sign up for a seed swap. So that said, thank you so much, Jacqueline, for your wonderful presentation. And bye for now. Thank you.